ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor to introduce two outstanding figures. First, Nikodai Tangen. He is entrusted with managing almost $2 trillion of Norway's wealth. With degrees in both art, history, and psychology, Nikodai's background is unique. He has been a chef, a Russian translator, and even worked in intelligence. But his expertise in economics honed at Wharton lay the groundwork for his success as a hedge fund manager. For the past four years, he has been at the helm of Norway's sovereign wealth fund, guiding, guiding it with integrity and skill. Joining him is Dr. Adam Posen, president of the Peterson Institute for International Economics. The Atlantic once suggested Adam belongs in an all-star $10 billion lineup if there were a central banking fantasy league. He's one of the most respected voices in international ec economics today. So we are grateful to Adam and the Peterson Institute for partnering us on this event. And I look forward to hearing Nikolai's opening remarks. Please. Thank you, uh, Ambassador and ladies and gentlemen. To understand um, the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund, we need to uh, go back in time. And um, we need to go back in time to 1969. And uh, roughly the same time of the year as we are now, but not in uh, sunny, warm Washington. We are out on the Norwegian shelf. It's cold, and we are on board Ocean Viking. And this is Philips drilling, and they have been drilling for quite some time. They haven't found a single drop of oil. And they're now drilling the last well. And if they don't find any oil, they have to pack up the toys and go home. And then two in the morning, um, the, um, this guy called Salveson is asked to wake up the platform chief, Ed Seaborn. And Ed Seaborn is like, Salveson, it's two in the morning. You better have a good reason for waking me up. And did he have a good reason? They had just struck oil. They found the Ecofisk field. And it was the largest field the world had ever seen. Then this was presented to the Norwegian people the day before Christmas Eve, 69. And the question was, was this a Christmas gift or not? Because we had seen in many countries that finding oil and these incredible resources had just been a curse. You know, it had led to crowded out of industries, led to huge amount of corruption. It had just not been very good. And so then the Norwegian politicians decided on something really clever. Let's put it into a fund. And this is the first deposit into the fund. In 96, two billion Norwegian kroner, you know? A small deposit, and nobody thought the fund was going to be particularly big. And the idea, of course, with the fund was to take the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the wealth from the shelf and put it into financial assets. And that's what we've done. So now it's gone from two billion Norwegian kroner to more than 18,000 billion. As you can see, the dark blue is the money that uh, we put into the fund. And the light blue is the returns that we have made in financial markets. And then we have some currency effects at the top. But you see that the returns that we made in the financial markets are now twice as large as the money we put in. So in a way, we found oil twice. Once on the continental shelf, and then again in financial markets. The governance structure of the fund is very important. So the money is owned by the Norwegian people, of course, uh, taken care of by the, the parliament. The parliament have 
uh, given the mandate to the Ministry of Finance. So it's the Ministry of Finance, which is our client. And we have a representative here from the ministry today, Espen, who is, uh, you know, in a way, my boss. Um, and then they have given the mandate again to Norges Bank, to the central bank, and they again have hired us, the Norwegian uh, Norges Bank Investment Management, to run the fund. There are um, some very important reasons why this, why this has worked out really well. Um, I would say one of the things is a very strict and good mandate that we have from the ministry. It's quite detailed about how we should invest, and I'm coming back to that, uh, but it is important to have a strict mandate. And that has worked really, really well. It's useful to be situated inside the central bank, and I think it will be increasingly important potentially going forward. Um, and then we have, uh, then it's, of course it's important that we work with the board, the board works with the ministry, that we have contact at all levels, but of course that we also at the same time understand what the roles are and who is accountable for what. So I think this has been um, a really, really good model. Another reason why it has worked so well is because of wide political anchoring. And here, this is from a seminar we had this summer. Three um, ministers, they had been ministers of finance, uh, all three of them, or treasurers, and um, they span a very broad political span. We here have from, uh, from kind of uh, the socialist left party to uh, the rightist party to the agrarian party. And um, they have all agreed on the main uh, kind of characteristics of the fund. They have agreed on the risk profile. And every year we have a white paper that goes to the, uh, to the parliament so that all changes in the mandate is agreed on by all political parties. I think it's totally key. So that when you change parliament or government, there is no change in the main ramifications for the fund. We invest across the world, and I think a fund of this size needs to be really widely diversified. We have uh, now half the money in uh, America, actually a bit more, a third in Europe, and then the rest is spread across the rest of the world. We started off by a larger proportion in Europe. That was kind of closer to home, and it was a bit less risky. Then uh, gradually we have moved more assets across uh, to the US. That's also, of course, because the US market has developed particularly strongly, now lately driven by, uh, you know, all your wonderful technology companies. And in terms of the asset split, we have now 70% equities, and the rest is uh, spread, mainly fixed income, but also uh, real estate. We own some amazing properties here in DC. We have main holdings in New York, Boston, uh, in London, Berlin, Paris, and so on. Um, and the, uh, it, it started off by being purely in bonds. Then during the financial crisis, the equity weightings went from 40% to 60%, and has subsequently moved to, uh, to 70%. And then three, four years ago, we also got the unlisted renewable infrastructure mandate, which in the beginning, we were pretty slow to deploy because we thought uh, that valuations were very high. Now we think it's much more attractive, right? There is less demand for uh, renewable infrastructure projects. We think returns are better. And so now we are, have accelerated the, the deployment of, uh, of money into that asset class. So we are one of the largest single shareholders in the world. We own one and a half percent of all the listed equities. And, you know, I kind of think every time you buy a Starbucks or new sneakers or, uh, you know, new car or whatever, I feel pretty happy about it because we get one and a half percent back. Um, <laughs> in Europe, we own uh, just under three percent of, uh, of all the equities. Now, how do we think? as an owner, owner. Well, we have um, very clear expectations when it comes to companies. And I think when you engage with the companies, what is important is that you are 
predictable. I think predictable is the most important thing. Um, we um, have clear expectations. We have expectation documents on the most important parameters. We have expectation documents when it comes to how companies should uh, treat corruption, how they should think about uh, labor, how they should think about uh, human rights issues, and so on. And so we have 10 expectation documents which lay out in, in great detail how we think they should uh, behave. We also um, engage with companies, um, and we have more than 3,000 company meetings a year. We have portfolio managers who are specialists on these companies. They meet with them on a regular basis and have conversations about all kinds of things, from labor rights um, to uh, disclosure levels, um, climate plans, and so on. And then, lastly, voting. Well, voting is, in a way, one of the most important ways we can Im influence companies. And so we attend um, nearly 10,000 AGMs every year. AGMs is a bit like this, a uh, meeting where all the shareholders come together. And we vote on more than 100,000 pro 100, proposals every year. Now, we, of course, have the votes that we own ourselves, one and a half percent. But what is interesting is that we have so many other shareholders across the world who look at how we vote. And now we disclose our voting intentions five days ahead of time. So we have an additional three percentage points of votes which follow us. So close to 5% of against votes in the world would be influenced by uh, our decisions. So it's a huge responsibility. And it means that we, uh, we take well care on how we vote, that it is consistent, that it's well communicated uh, to the companies. Lastly, um, transparency, very, very important. We are the most transparent fund in the world, and that's not just a claim, because actually there is a world championship in transparency. Uh, <laughs> now, for several years, we were lagging uh, the Canadians. We thought, we think it's kind of okay to be beaten by the Canadians in ice hockey, but not in transparency. So last year, we cracked up the efforts. Uh, we won for the first time, and then last week, uh, we won again. And it's, it's really, really important, because what we see is that transparency and knowledge creates trust. And so we are transparent with the Norwegian people. We are the only fund which discloses all our holdings twice a year. And pretty much everything we do is out there. So to conclude, in my mind, the success factors for the fund has been you know, a clear and good mandate from the ministry. It's been broad political anchoring. It's been a spending rule which decides how much we can take out of the fund every year, and that's limited at uh, 3%. And then lastly, it is the transparency. Thank you. And then, Adam, we're going to have a chat here. Thank you. Yeah. Sit over here. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> I just couldn't make it in one stride. I'm not as tall as you. Okay. Thank you, Nikolai. Um, thank you all for coming out. When the embassy approached uh, the Peterson Institute to host Nikolai, we were all like, oh my god, yeah, sure, great. Um, and then the, the embassy was like, and we'll pay for the food. I was like, oh yeah, sure, great. Um, but then they said, and it's going to be on Monday, November 11th, and I was like, you're bloody kidding me, right? Um, but obviously, the fund, their CEO, uh, the prospects for long-term thinking, uh, this is all very attractive to people. And so that's why we have such a distinguished crowd and such a full crowd tonight. So thank you all for coming out. I'm going to ask Nikolai a few questions and uh, have a bit of a discussion, and then we'll open it up to the audience. Uh, I see a lot of familiar faces, and. I fail to recognize some others that I should probably recognize and will try to pretend otherwise. Nikolai, why don't we dive right into it? Um, you and I were talking briefly before your remarks, and you were saying how this is a really interesting time to be an investor. Um, there's geopolitics, there's technological change, there's climate change. How does this come together for you? I mean, if 
in a sense, you could just index and just buy a little bit of everything, but that's not what you do. So how, do you, how does this confluence of forces affect your thinking? Yeah, I think um, cl um, climate, geopolitics, technology, and finance are intertwined in a way that we have never seen before. And it started to happen probably four or five years ago, where for the first time we saw, if we just take the various links here, um, First of all, the link between uh, climate and finance is becoming increasingly clear. And it's mainly because of harvests, which are getting worse and worse. And so you are seeing increasing prices for everything from you know, cocoa beans, uh, chocolate, olive oil, orange juice, all these kind of things. It's really underpinning inflation, which of course is one of the biggest threats to you know, stock markets. So that's a, new, that's a new one, and I think the link is just becoming stronger and stronger. Then we see technology and finance. We see it, of course, because what is driving the markets these days is mainly the technology companies, and they are just getting bigger and bigger. And so we are seeing a concentration in the stock market, which is bigger than we've ever seen before. And it's driven by many things. I mean, one is that in society generally, we have a winner-takes-it-all situation. You know, there are more people now listening to Taylor Swift than everybody listening to jazz and classical music combined, right? So you see it in sport, and you see it in finance. You see it in technology companies more than in other companies, because just the fact that you are big makes you even bigger. The reason why you order an, an Uber is because there are so many of them, they come straight away. The reason why you're on Facebook is because there's so many people on. And then in AI, you kind of turbocharge that again, because these models are so expensive to develop that you need to be very big to really make something out of it. So. That's kind of the technology impact on the stock market. Now, then you have technology impacting geopolitics. You know, the relationship between China and the US, very much uh, impacted by technology, export controls, uh, these kind of things, and um, impacting now um, research in so many new areas. Two of the Nobel Prizes of the last few weeks have been driven by AI, both uh, physics and chemistry. So uh, it's really just changing the landscapes. And then, of course, you have the, the geopolitical situation, which is new. So all this is coming together in, in a totally new way, right? Which means that when I wake up in the morning, I'm just like spinning out of bed because you don't want to spend time in bed when you can read the papers and look into what's going on because it's just so exciting. I don't know about you, but... I'm, 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 I'm thinking about that. You don't look like you're spinning I, I, yeah, out of yeah, No, exactly. Well, it's partly I don't have $2 trillion to manage, but it's also, there's that emoji, you know, with the clenched teeth. Um, but let, let, let's try to translate that excitement. So if the trends are clear, in a sense, that the incumbents, the large players, the, the already technologically advanced, the already networked, are going to get bigger and bigger, why are you reading the papers? I mean, is there any possibility of deconcentration? Um, is there disruption the US can do to China or vice versa that would change the game? Um, I mean, there, there seems to be a bit of a tension between the way you describe the trends and your excitement to get up and do something. <laughs> now, what is, what is, of course, um, in a way, uh, interesting here as well, is that the largest companies are linked into the same geopolitical risks. Right. right. Um, now you look at the, for instance, the biggest gain is we had in the portfolio in the first half of this year. So you have ASML in Holland, they make the machines to produce microchips. They sell them to, uh, to you know, one Taiwanese company. Uh, the chips are, uh, the most advanced chips are designed by NVIDIA, of course, and they sell them to the super, uh, you know, scalers. So Meta, um, you know, Amazon, and so on. And so um, it's very concentrated in terms of the risks we're seeing, you know. It's um, geographically quite concentrated, and if something happened, it impacts most of the uh, supply chains for most of the kind of things that we consume. So it's um, at the time where we have, in a way, more concentration than ever before, it's linked to one geopolitical situation in a way that we also haven't seen before. So that's, ex that's uh, exciting. How can a fund like yours 
in a sense, hedge or take advantage of these geopolitical risks? I mean, or is it like the weather, you know where climate is and you just have to reset your expectations? No, you want to, uh, there are, uh, the important things there is one that you have, uh, that you're broadly diversified mm -hmm. across the world, across asset classes, uh, very important. The second thing is you need to have a long-term time horizon mm -hmm. so that if you do have um, volatility in the market, you can take advantage of it. So I think, the, uh, I think those are the, the most important things. Um, Norway, another part of the Norwegian government, as it were, um, as the ambassador represents here, um, has been pursuing a pretty strong foreign and security policy, worrying about Russia, leadership in NATO, alliance with the US, it's part of that. Um, what, what happens down the road? What happens if there are great opportunities in China or Russia and the foreign policy of Norway is, let's say, concerned about the behavior of Russia or China? How do you, how do you, is there a statute on how you have to deal with that or is this a judgment thing? How do you think about that? Yeah, so um, one, another important thing is that um, the fund is not a political tool. Mm -hmm. Very, very important. We have one goal and that is to make money. Right. In a responsible way mm -hmm. and with a set level of risk. But it's very, very important that we are not used as a political tool. As long as, when you start to get like several goals, you are not really accountable anymore. And you can always blame uh, lack of results on something else. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, uh, I think that's really key. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to Russia, um, in a way, that was the first time that, um, that the parliament uh, made a political decision about the fund. We were told that we were to sell out of Russia. But I think that was a, quite an extreme situation. We don't expect uh, that to be repeated anytime soon. Just more broadly, maybe it's the parliament in your case, but there's also consumer investor demands for more concern about green issues, about investment in so-called dirty industries. One of the issues, one of the many issues where uh, the incoming Trump administration is likely to differ from the past administration is trying to diminish some of the environmental regulations and standards in the US. Um, how, does, how do the pressures over green affect you? Does that count as political? So you, it's only if the parliament overrides? Or do you, you mentioned the importance of the climate transition. I mean, how do you think about this when there's demands for response? Yeah, I would say that we, um um, we follow the instructions from the parliament. Um, the Norwegian parliament is uh, unified in believing that climate is important and that we should, uh, in constructive dialogue with the companies, um, try to be supportive for their, um, for their work uh, towards a net zero world. And so that's what we are doing. So we um, have not changed our mind or our way of working. We continue to be uh, persistent and, um, and predictable. It was very striking in your opening remarks, at least to me, um, your slide talking about active but not activist. And you're saying that you want to be predictable and you just said it again. Where, I mean, since you are the most transparent fund, congratulations. Where are some examples of where that kind of interaction with companies you have stake in have made a difference? I mean, where have you been active but not activist that you think you've had a good influence? I mean, good however you define it, but where you've had an impact. Yeah. Um, Oops. Well, we do, see, um, we do see that where we engage and where we talk to companies about uh, the importance of having a, a, you know, a carbon reduction plan. We see that more companies have plans. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's a development that, um, of course, we are, we are not the sole reason for that, no. but we, we can see a relationship between engagement and results. 
we see it again. We have been advocating the fact that the chair and the CEO should not be the same person. We think it's good governance, and we are used to that from Europe, that it should be two different people. Uh, in the US, over the last 10 years, it's gone from 45% of companies who have, I mean, which have kind of uh, the combined uh, function in one to 35. So 45 to 35 over a 10 year period. So that's have had some impact. Where we have had no progress whatsoever is on uh, pay packages. Mm -hmm. um, now what we do, we are not, uh, we are not uh, against high salaries, but they need to be, uh, they need to be uh, in line with our interests. They should be long-term, they should be tied to results, they should be equity-based and so on. And so we got pretty clear uh, expectations for how that should be structured. But, um, but you know, pay packages are continuing to move up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another one of the slides you put up, you, you had a pie chart about the uh, asset allocation across four classes, uh, equities, fixed income, real estate, and unlisted energy, I think it was. Um, we have seen in recent years another financial trend is more and more companies going private, at least in the US, but I think elsewhere as well. Um, fewer and fewer companies listing publicly. How does this affect the fund's thinking? Is this something that you're going to react to by taking more private investment placements? Is this something you view as an opportunity because you have thinner public markets and you can get more of what you want? I'm, I'm not trying to feed words in your mouth. I'm trying to ask, you know, so just as one of the world's leading investors, how do you think about this trend? Yeah, well, you're right. There are fewer companies being listed on a stock exchange. And amongst the ones listed, it's more concentrated. Yeah. So fewer companies account for more and more of the index. And so there is a much higher risk in the stock market mm -hmm. from that point of view than what's been the case before. I would probably argue that there is more risk in the listed market now than in the unlisted. Mm -hmm. We are not, uh, it's not in our mandate to be in uh, private equity. It's something that uh, the fund has suggested several times. And there is now a political process where um, they will investigate further whether we should be allowed to do that. There's been questions about fee structures. Mm -hmm. The general opinion in Norway is that the fees are very high and that transparency has been low and that ESG considerations have been low. Now, I think for sure transparency has been improving and ESG considerations have been improving and corporate governance have been improving. So we'll see what, um, we'll see what uh, they come up with. I mean, it's a, it's a good process. Um, I actually think personally it's probably a good time to scale into uh, you know, a private, a private market because um, they, they, are, they are having a tough time. Mm -hmm. I think you can get pretty good uh, uh, fee deals and, um, and you can also get, get positions in the, in the secondary market. Mm -hmm. So it feels a bit like increasing the uh, equity share during the financial crisis. That's the way it feels to me, potentially with private equity, right? But we'll see, nothing is decided. Very good. Um, I'm gonna come to the audience for questions in the, in the next few minutes. And um, I believe we're trying to record this, so I don't know if there's a traveling mic or yes, it looks like there's a tall person with a traveling mic, so that's good. Um, but just a couple more questions before that, if I could, please. Um, we have with us tonight Ted Truman, who was one of the leaders in the effort to get sovereign wealth funds to have standards of transparency. Um, obviously, there are some very large funds that do not get a successful rating in transparency as you or the Canadians. Um, not asking you to name names, um, but in general, I mean, is is the transparency something that makes you more accountable? Is the transparency something that makes you more palatable in when you're investing abroad? Is the transparency something the humor of the parliament? I mean, you, you, don't, you don't have a lot of investors, right? You have one investor. So is, the, is transparency an unalloyed good for a fund? Yeah, I mean, on the one hand, we got one investor. On the other, on the other hand, we kind of got five million investors, right? Because um, it's owned by the citizens. Uh, I think it's key to trust. I think it's key to trust. Um, I just love transparency. You know, I think it means that you you stick to what you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. 
you are accountable. You get everybody to run in the same direction. Everybody knows, knows what we are about. Um, so I, I, I see no... Uh, the, only, the only reason why, why transparency could be negative would be if people started to trade against your positions. Mm -hmm. And that's why we think disclosing them every, th every six months is, is right, but more frequent than that would not be, would not be very sensible. Very clear. So my final question before I open it to the audience is about the purposes and the capacities to make a sovereign wealth fund work for our country. I mean, you spoke about, you have the beautiful repeat image of, was it 1969, discovering oil in the last well at 2 a.m. Um, but so then there's a very compelling story, right? That the oil's gonna run out sometime, our country needs to accumulate. People have started talking about the US should have a sovereign wealth fund, um, which strikes me as kind of odd because we don't have the surpluses you do. Um, but maybe I'm missing something. So without commenting directly on that, I mean, when is a sovereign wealth fund a good idea for a country? Could it be a country that you know, like Denmark, doesn't have oil but has uh, anti-obesity drugs, and they should run a sovereign wealth fund off that. I mean, what 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 countries should be following your example? Yeah, I mean, in a way, they have a sovereign wealth fund in Denmark as well, but it's called the Nova Nordisk Foundation, right? Which funds uh, research and a, a lot of incredible things. Um, and in a way, they kind of have them in Sweden too, through the Wolberg sphere and some of their uh, foundations, but. Um, well, where it works the best is if you have some kind of windfall profit uh, that you want to save uh, and safeguard for future generations, right? So that's kind of the starting point. And then I would say what's worked for, for us in Norway is um, uh, broad anchoring of the mandate, a spending rule, which, by the way, was made by, by Jens Stoltenberg, the um, ex-Secretary um, General of NATO when he was the Minister of Finance and Prime Minister. Um, and then, and, then the, um, and then the transparency, I would say. Yeah. Sorry, one final question then. Um, a number of us uh, economists, at least, and some finance people have commented on the idea that the equilibrium interest rate, the, so let's say the ten, average 10-year interest rate on safe government debt is rising, partly because of fiscal excess, partly because of productivity growth, but for a variety of views, it's rising. If we're going to be in a persistent high rate or higher rate environment, how does that affect your thinking about your allocations, your investment? How does that affect the draw rule? I mean, should Parliament be revisiting the 3%, 3.5% based on what the interest rate is, or is that something that should just remain fixed? Well, sometimes um, having uh, an unchanged rule in itself has a very strong value, right? Mm -hmm. So instead of kind of fine-tuning it and changing it often, to have something kind of set in stone, mm -hmm. it's a really good thing. So I'll be surprised if that rule was revisited anytime soon. Okay. Not going to get a conceptual answer, but a very clear answer. Um, let me open it up. Uh, who would like to ask a question? Okay. It seems like the left side of the panel if you could get the gentleman there, third row. Please say your name and identify yourself when asking a question. My name is Anupam Kanna, ex-World Bank. Well, question related to what your answer was, but context. Is how is the different, what is the difference between your governance and objective from some of the Middle Eastern fronts like the Saudi fund or the UAE, Qatar, or the other side, which is very much in the news here, university endowment funds, which are also public interest. Just to make it more specific to the current debate, <clears throat> you talked about ESG. The financial sector has latched on to ESG indicators, but almost all the academic research, including two NBER papers this week, show that ESG is used more as an enrichment of the CEO rather than having any real impact. So what is your view on that? 
Maybe we'll collect two questions at a time. So if you well, can hand, no, there was there was kind of two there already. So yeah, yeah, yeah. But let I, me let I don't me. Think I can remember all this. Should I'll we... remember for you. The person in front of you. If you could go to the gentleman in front of him. Uh, that, that's actually a good piggyback on my question. What's your name? Kevin Dangworth from the Milk Institute. My question specifically was: I think most U.S. asset managers and allocators share your strong convictions on climate over the long term, but they butt up against fiduciary duty here in the United States. You can't generate or demonstrate, unless you can demonstrate quantifiable alpha, you can't say climate investing generates alpha. So if you could speak to maybe the U.S. managers and allocators who might want to allocate more towards climate, but butt up against our FCC, butt up against fiduciary duty, what are some of the tangible specifics in terminal value or multiple expansion, whatever it is, uh, when you make your assessment, probably more towards the medium term. Okay, so um, comparison with other uh, sovereign wealth fund, uh, it's fair to say that uh, some of the funds we don't know so much about it, right? Because they are quite secretive and not very transparent. And uh, you know, even a fantastic fund like GAC in Singapore, they re they report their returns on a rolling twenty-year basis, and they don't disclose assets, right? So so it's difficult to know sometimes. But um, no, many of them are really, really great firms. Um, it's uncertain to me sometimes whether they are part of the foreign policy of the country or whether they are, uh, have a goal of just uh, trying to generate the highest possible financial returns. Uh, we don't know. Some of them are spending money domestically. We don't do that. We only spend money outside of Norway. Um, the whole point was to, to kind of keep the capital outside, not to distort uh, the domestic economy and, uh, and the currency. How we compare with U.S. endowments? Well, there, you have some amazing endowments in this country, right? Um, and I have, in my previous life, been managing capital for many of them. I would say the main difference, they probably, um, they are more into alternative assets. Uh, they are using more external managers. They are, they are uh, you know, quite comfortable by paying uh, quite high fees because they really look at net returns. And in our part of the world, we have a problem paying big fees, right? It's just something we really don't like. And then uh, ESG. Yeah. Well, for sure, I would say that ESG has nothing to do with enriching CEOs. I, I, I really don't see that link. Um, and also kind of um, combining that. The thing is that if you, if you own 20 companies, you don't really necessarily have to care so much. But if you own the whole world like we do, you know, one and a half percent of the whole world. If you have one company polluting here, you pick it up in all your other holdings. You have to care. And if you, hear, if you have like a 50 to 100 year investment horizon, you definitely have to care. Uh, and as we talked about earlier, you know, the link between climate and inflation is, is clearly there. Uh, we see it now and we do see it in reinsurance rates. They're going up. We do see it in productivity in some parts of the world. You cannot work in the middle of the day because it's too hot, right? So you are, you are seeing it in many, in many different ways. And I, uh, you know, we argue that, uh, that it is a financial risk. Thank you. Um, hey, great. All these questions. Yeah, I know. I know. Time. That's fine by me. Um, can we get the two ladies in the second row, please? Fran Burwell, the Athletic Council, McClarty Associates. I was struck by the difference of your level of investments in the United States versus Europe. Um, and I wondered if you could explain a bit what you find lacking in Europe in terms of investment and uh, what you would suggest that Europe do. As you know, there's a big discussion about this with both the Letha and Draghi reports saying how important additional investment would be in Europe. My name is Constanza Schiffsmuller, and I run the Center on the U.S. and Europe, the Brookings Institution. Um, you presented uh, the work of your fund as very transparent, admirably so, um, fundamentally apolitical. But we live in a time uh, when very wealthy billionaires, tech billionaires, are taking overtly political positions. Uh, positions that are anti-democratic and, in fact, uh, exhibiting a distinct fondness for autocratic political models. How do you feel about that? And what do you think is the responsibility 
the civic responsibility of people in your position in that context. Thank you. Um, Europe. Um, so I'm a proud European, okay? Um, but um, we, see, we see that productivity growth in Europe has been not very strong and for sure uh, less than what we see in America. And it is um, it's really worth reading the Draghi report because it lays out in great detail why that is the case. And it has to do with um, the industry mix. We have little technology, which has been driving growth. We have quite a lot of kind of old industries. Uh, and that's where a lot of the research money is still going in, you know, into the car industry, for instance. Um, there is something with mentality in Europe. Um, we take less risks. You know, if you go bankrupt in Europe, you, are, you normally don't get a second chance. Here, it's part of your learning, right? Um, so there is a higher willingness for making mistakes and for taking risks, and it's something really positive about that. And then it's just the mentality, right? I mean, hey, I went to business school here. You know, 5%. Is that a high or a low number? In Europe, they think it's a high number. In America, it's a really low number, right? It's just something with how you, are, how you anchor your ambitions. So there are a lot of things there. I think for the moment now, it's what we're seeing is, uh, and it's also, of course, regulation. And we, have, we meet with CEOs uh, across the various countries. Um, there is a lot of regulation. Um, and that's really holding back, uh, you know, R&D establishments, uh, innovation, uh, and so on. What would it take to, to get it to move? Uh, well, uh, Draghi claims that it takes uh, quite a bit of money and it takes, uh, takes leadership, right? Then is it our responsibility to think about um, extremely wealthy people who... Um, like yeah, who like what I don't think that's our task to sort out. I think that's somebody else who needs to... Look at that. Okay, that was clear. Um, all right, we got two. This is nice when people sit together for questions. So we got two, another pair here. Ted Truman, formerly of the Peterson Institute. Uh, thank you, Adam. Uh, when I first started studying sovereign wealth funds, one of my colleagues said that uh, sovereign wealth fund in Norway has been a political issue at all times. Every election is about the sovereign wealth fund. Now, you emphasize that the consensus among politicians in, in uh, Norway, at least at the present, so has that changed? Or is the question of what you're doing with the money or how much is spent now rather than later, which I think is Joe's question, uh, 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 is that still an issue in, uh, in, in, in Norway? And, and you have a Problem, I guess, in some sense, so much of the budget is paid out of the out of the sovereign wealth fund. Is that a, is that a problem in terms of the domestic politics? Uh, Joe Gagnon, Peterson Institute. Uh, actually, Ted, that wasn't going to be my question, but I, I liked your question. I hope I, I'm looking forward to the answer. My, my question is about the is, is success raising its its own problems uh, in the sense that. Uh, the purpose of the fund is to save resources for the future generations as you pump the oil out, but almost no countries in the world have ever done that. Uh, most oil exporters never save anything. In, you know, in, in recent decades there's been some efforts, and a few have, have succeeded and are up there with Norway, like the Tina Gulf and maybe Singapore, uh, with oil funds. But most, it would be hard to say not. So does this growing inequality sort of the, the sort of gap between those who a few who have succeeded beyond anyone's dreams, and I think it's quite fair to say that over the years the fund has grown much bigger than projected every ten years. It's bigger than projected. Uh, it, does that success raise these tensions or issues either inside Norway or outside in terms of the inequality uh, that it presents? There is a very um, there, there is a very uh, clear. Um, split uh, in terms of the roles we have in Norway, right? So we spend no time on how the money is going to be spent. That's the politicians. The only thing we care about is to make money. 
and then it goes into the budget. Next year is projected at 2.5% of the fund, and it will cover something like 23% of the budget. Uh, but how it's going to be dispersed and spent, that's, we have nothing to do with it, and we would never talk about that because we would not uh, be seen to try to interfere in political matters. Um, does it create uh, increased inequality within the country? No, I mean, uh, the fund uh, decreased inequality within the country because it's being used on education, uh, you know, healthcare and, uh, and so on. Does it increase, uh, you know, the wealth of Norway relative to other countries? Um, yes, I guess it, it, it does. But it's interesting what you say, that countries generally have not kept large uh, wealth for a long time. You're right. There has, never been, there has never been a successful fund for a very long time. Never. In the history of the world. Now, how, um, how could this fund disappear? Well, it could disappear if, uh, if you had a massive drawdown in financial markets caused by something which is really bad, and so therefore you would not adjust down the spending of the fund so you, um, and at the same time, you sack management and close investment positions at the wrong time. Then the fund doesn't last for long. That's the main risk. Thank you. I've been leaning to my left without symbolism. Is there some one or two people who'd like to ask a question on this side of the room? Yeah, and back, please. Yeah, I think it will. Um, I think it will go up. Um, well, we when we got it into our mandate um, in twenty one, I well we we thought that the returns in that part of the market was not, they were not very attractive. <laughs> it's kind of really difficult to remember back to the days, but you know, green investment that it was so hot you couldn't get in. Uh, all the boards told all the investment managers, you have to increase your green investments because otherwise we look stupid and we won't get any clients. Massive, massive pressure to make investments at very low returns, huge competition. It was just really not attractive. So we made one investment and then we just paused and didn't do much for a long period of time. Now I think it's very different, right? Um, much less focus, I mean, clearly in the States, uh, the, the view started to change first. It's coming to Europe to a certain extent. Uh, there is less competition for, uh, for renewable infrastructure projects. And they are more attractive. They, we, they are, you know, we, we have done a few lately and we think we'll do more. Anyone else from this side like to raise their hand? Okay, back over here. I got five. Okay, so uh, the two in the back row, the lady and the gentleman there, I don't care which order. Hi, I'm Wes Hayes from Monticello Associates. Good to see you. Question about fixed income. We talked about the equity side of the portfolio. We're curious about the role of fixed income in your portfolio. Uh, in a world where correlations have gotten tighter, is it liability management? Is it duration positioning? How do you think about the role of fixed income in, this, in, in the fund? And before he answers it, uh, if you could go to the lady over there, please. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. I have a follow-up question on the gentleman's and your answer. I would like to know uh, your views of sovereign wealth funds investing domestically. We see other than some countries at the Middle East and the developed countries now, governments wanting to establish such funds. What do you think? Is it the benefits and risks? Thank you. Well, I, I think, I mean, whether uh, wealth funds should spend money uh, domestically or abroad, I think that totally depends on the function of the fund and why it was established, right? You could make a good argument for both. But for us, it was to keep, uh, to keep the money outside the country. So very clear, uh, very clear part of the structure. Fixed income is there to balance returns. Um, and we also have a very good rebalancing rule so that when, um, when equities go up a lot and come uh, and go uh, you know, above where they should be, we rebalance and, and vice versa. So uh, when stocks are high, we sell them and put more into bonds and the other way around. So 
It's a rebalancing rule, which again has been made by the Minister of Finance and which works really well. Um, okay, so that dealt with the second question. Okay, and the first question, yeah. All right, so the gray-haired gentleman there and the gray-haired gentleman there. <laughs> so I don't discriminate. I'm the hairless gentleman here, so it's okay. Wilson Center, when you were talking about risk, uh, we're running enormous deficits here where you have a half year investments and they don't look like they're going down anytime soon. At, at some point, is there a risk of a bondholder revolt or anything like that that would affect overall your investments here in the U.S.? And then that gentleman, yeah. Thank you, Mark Sobel. Um, I have two closely related interjections. You get one, Mark. <laughs> no, you get one question, not two. All right. I'll phrase it down to one then. <laughs> You'll get cut off if you cheat. <laughs> so you have two trillion dollars for a country of five million people. It's a self-sustaining fund in perpetuity. Um, and um, you transfer three percent of GDP, as you said, to the budget every year. But why do you need a fund that um, exists into eternity and why not provide, for example, some tax cuts or something like that, more money to benefit citizens in Norway currently? Thank you. That was a good one question. <laughs> Well, uh, tax, <clears throat> taxes, that, I mean, that's a political decision that politicians have to answer for. Um, yeah, I haven't got a view on, on taxes. Um, Is there a, de a debt scenario, public debt scenario in the U.S. that would cause you to rethink your overweight allocation? I think it's a very, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a very, very good question, of course. <clears throat> and the budget deficit situation is... Uh, is in a way front of uh, front of mind. Uh, but it's a very uh, and I'm asking a lot of the the biggest brains in this country to try to figure out what they think and where is the where is the pain point, and where do you start to get start to get worried and at which level will investors suddenly start to demand a much higher rate to uh, to buy uh, government debt? I, I don't think I have a good answer, but it's certainly something. Uh, we watch, of course, the, uh, we hear the same from IMF, right? They have been very clear and loud about it, and, and the World Bank and so on. So um, there are many very clever people who are worried about it. Okay, uh, back there. And I'm looking over here, looking over here. No, okay, back there. Thanks. Uh, Sunil Sharma from George Washington University. Uh, the environmental shock is clearly a global systemic shock. At the same time, with the science geopolitical risks, we know that the recent World Bank and the IMF reports have put out, most countries have very high government debts as well as private debts. So, going forward, are you expecting lower returns given the situation? Yeah, I do expect lower returns going forward. Um, because um, we've had a very long period of falling interest rates from high levels down to zero, and now they're back up a bit, but, you know, um, not huge. We do see underlying some inflationary uh, forces, as we mentioned in the food market, for instance. Um, the valuations in the stock markets are higher. So I think we should expect uh, returns to be lower going forward. I think it's going to be difficult to make a lot of money. So I think the endowments um, need to be very careful with their expectations. They need to be uh, focused in on expectation management. That's no fun. Um, it's probably right, but it's no fun. Um, one last question, unless you're... I think we have four minutes left till the witching hour. Going once. Yes, that gentleman. Thank you. Uh, Ashraf Haq from Ravenswood Partners. Uh, one of the big uh, trends in the U.S. has been the passive versus active uh, trend, and you used to run an active fund. Now you're you know, a 2% owner of all of world's assets. Where is your view of where this all shakes out, uh, at least in U.S. markets? Well, I think it's very interesting, the passive versus uh, active debate. Um, 
we, we, what we do is that we run the capital uh, close to the index. And so we have index weights from the ministry, and then we have a risk budget, which tells us how far from the index we can be. Um, there's clearly uh, more and more money going into passive. And, um, but the problem is somebody, somebody needs to be active because you need to establish prices in the market and somebody needs to be responsible and vote uh, and so on. So I suspect that the development will continue in the direction of passive uh, and we will continue to do a combination of both. Great, one of the great things about, I believe you already had a question. One of the great things about doing an event with a Norwegian, a financial visionary, someone who has a reporting relationship inside a central bank, all these aspects along with Nikolai's obvious personal talents mean you do get frank answers, clear answers, brief answers. It's a real learning experience for me and I believe everyone in the audience uh, thank you for including this form of transparency in your Washington visit and thanks to the ambassador and the Norwegian embassy, the Royal Norwegian embassy. We at the Peterson Institute in the spirit of transparency do have some support from Norges Bank Investment Management and are proud and have learned a lot from the relationship and we hope we'll continue to enable learning in both directions. Thank you all very much. Thank you.